Goddard Space Flight Center, NASA, when he joined them in 1987. And since this is a tides talk, the proper way to measure how long we've known each other, we are now on one and a half lunar tidal nodal periods. How many of you know what that means? <laughs> I, I asked, I asked Al, that was, no, it was Bob Byrne, I asked Bob Byrne, he said, how many do you think? He said, well, answer yes, he said, no. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently my Tides lecture doesn't do very well. So anyway, Richard and I have known each other for 29 years now, so it's a uh, great pleasure. Richard has been at NASA at the Goddard Space Flight Center um, that time, he said you joined in 1987, yes? Right. And, um, He's going to be talking to you about tides here now. Richard is one of the world's experts on tides, especially tides um, using satellite altimetry, and um, which is something that started in the late 80s with um, Geosat, but then really took off with the repeat missions starting with Topex and Jason and the series that have gone since. Um, Richard is a fellow of the American Geophysical Union and also the American Meteorological Society. And in addition to his tides work, um, he's also done a lot of work on global sea level and tide gauge reconstructions, uh, working with um, Bruce Douglas. So Ray and Douglas' paper, I can uh, give you the site for it if you like. <laughs> but today, his tide is going to be about um, his tide is going to be about his talk is going to be about tides and particularly tides going to Boris might not call it turbulence, but we'll call it mixing if we have to. <laughs> okay, I'll probably get nailed then. So, yeah. Well, thanks, Gary. It's a real pleasure to be here. I've never been to USF before, so it's nice to visit. So I should try to explain that uh, subtitle a little bit. Um, probably 20 or 30 years ago, I think it's safe to say that an awful lot of oceanographers. We're not very interested in tides. It was considered to be old hat, almost Victorian. It wasn't anything to do with circulation or anything. I can remember David Cartwright, who was one of the great tide gurus, complaining to me that he would often uh, have trouble organizing a session on tides at a general conference. They would only allow it if it was uh, co-organized with earth tide people. And of course, earth tide people have completely different uh, problems. Well, nowadays, that's no longer the case. If you go to the ocean sciences meeting, there's almost always a session on uh, tides, uh, maybe even more than a session on tides. And the difference is um, all stemming from this connection through tides, internal tides, mixing, turbulence, or whatever, and the connection to the circulation. And so that's generated uh, a lot of... Um, interest. It's all tied up in tidal friction, so my talk basically is tidal friction and its implications. Now maybe because I'm at, at uh, NASA and I sit in a geodesy branch at NASA, I always like to start off with the astronomy and the geodesy. So uh, you're going to have to suffer through a little bit of that, but it won't take long. I'll get to the oceans in a minute. So if you talk about tidal friction, you have to show this iconic uh, this kind of iconic picture of tidal friction. You have the uh, Earth's two-sided uh, tidal bulge there. And because of friction, there's a delay in the time of the formation of that bulge. The Earth's rotation then sweeps that bulge out ahead of the, head of the moon. And so you have the geometry as shown here. So there's a few implications. If you think about the uh, gravitational force of the moon up on this tide, it's a lot larger than it is uh, on, on this uh, bulge there. So that uh, acts to uh, break the Earth's rotation. At the same time, there's a gravitational force of each of these bulges on the moon. And if you think about the gravitational force uh, decomposed in the long track direction, then the component from this bulge is a little larger than the component from this bulge. So the moon experiences an long track thrust, which tends to push it up into a higher orbit away from the Earth at reduced angular velocity. So the angular velocity of the moon, n, and the rotational speed of the Earth, omega, are both decreasing with time. OK. so. Um, and, and these are the rates that they're decreasing, 26 arc seconds per century per century for the moon, and the Earth is a lot bigger than that. 
So there are a few things to say about this picture. One is, um, th this picture of a two-sided bulge like that is not a bad picture of the earth tide. The earth tide really looks like that, except the, the uh, lag has been much exaggerated. The lag of, of the solid earth is really only a fraction of a degree. But the ocean tide, of course, it looks nothing like that. If the ocean tide looked like that, then tidal prediction would be an easy business. <laughs> But the point is that in a discussion of tidal friction, you want to expand the ocean tide into a series of spherical harmonics, say. And you, when you evaluate integrals like work rates or tidal torques, all the spherical harmonics drop out by orthogonality except this one of degree two order two. So in a discussion of tidal friction, it's quite legitimate to show the ocean tide is simply a, a two-sided bulge like this. And in fact, for the ocean tide, that lag is not big enough. The M2 lag is actually 60 degrees. It's a solid tide, very tiny. The ocean tide, very large. And one final thing on this slide. You also often hear about secular acceleration of the moon. The acceleration is actually negative. It's minus 26. But if you go back and think about the 19th century, they always use the term secular acceleration of the moon. In the 19th century, it really was secular acceleration, positive. And that's because in the 19th century, the best way to keep time was the rotating Earth, what we call UT1. When UT1, the moon really is accelerating because the Earth is slowing down at a much higher rate than the Earth, than the moon is slowing down, okay? So the... Uh, in UT1, it really does look like the moon is positively accelerating. It really wasn't until the end of the 19th century that people started figuring out, oh, they're both decelerating, and, and they figured out what was happening. That was the end of the 19th century. And really, none, none of these numbers really were even in the ballpark until around the 1940s when people started inventing things like ephemeris time. Okay, so I'm just getting started, but I'm going to take a detour real quick all of a sudden here, right at the beginning. This is the picture I just showed you. You can also have, if the moon is going around the Earth faster than it spins, you can have this picture where the bulge can't keep up with the moon. Then all the torques are reversed and the moon spirals into the Earth. There's a beautiful example of that in our solar system. Anybody know? Nope. Phobos. Yeah, Phobos goes around Mars uh, almost three times for every Martian day. So it's spiraling inward. And if you look at the position of Phobos as observed and compare that with what Phobos would be if you just assume a constant angular velocity, you get this nice, beautiful parabola that goes back to 1880 when Phobos was first discovered. It's just a lovely uh, quadratic uh, indicating friction. Um, the acceleration of Phobos is 27 degrees per century per century. Now, I just told you the moon was 26, but that was 26 arc seconds per century per century. This is 27 degrees, so Phobos is really moving, which means that it's not long for this world. It might last another 40 million years, and that'll be the end of Phobos. Our moon is not doing that. It's moving away from us. We know that very well because... Um, there are retro reflectors on the lunar surface, per, first put there in 1969. And uh, th there are laser ranging then done to these retro reflectors. And by the way, this is the one experiment from the Apollo era that is still ongoing. There are bean counters in Washington that try to kill it all the time, but it's still ongoing. And it's useful to have a very long time series like this because this... Um, Lunar acceleration is quadratic, so the longer the time series you get, you can really beat down the errors. So that's a very low uncertainty there. And the other thing you can do, in addition to uh, lunar laser ranging and see the, the fact that it's moving away from you. By the way, I, there's the rate that it's moving away, 3.8 centimeters per year. You can also do, um, study uh, librations of the moon because you have an array of retro reflectors here, so you can see it's wobble and learn something about the interior of the moon. And you can also do things like uh, study, uh, put constraints on, on uh, general relativity. Most of these papers are by Jim Williams at JPL. Wonderful work. Okay, so 
there's the experimental evidence that the moon is really moving away, as I predicted in that first view graph. How about the Earth's rotation? Is it slowing down? Well, this is a time series of um, changes in the length of day, going back 150 years or so, and milliseconds. So that's minus 4 to plus 4 milliseconds. And you can see, well, maybe you could fit a trend to that and say, yeah, the Earth is really slowing down. But in the face of all this decadal variability, it's really hard to know for sure. That decadal variability is thought to be due to the fluid motion in the core. You'd really want to have a longer time series. And there's a way to get that by using ancient eclipse data. And really, you only need one good eclipse. And the best one I know about is this one that occurred in uh, ancient Iraq in 136 BC. And people, the historians, think they know exactly where these observations were made because they have lots of uh, clay tablets like this where all these things have been recorded. Now the nice thing about this is if you assume the Earth's rotation rate is fixed and then you spin it backwards until you reach 136 BC, you don't come up with this path here, you come up with this path. The, the spin hasn't got back far enough to, to be under Babylon. So, so that difference right there tells you the change basically in the angle that the Earth has made over these 20 centuries. You can use that um, to work out then what the mean change of the length of day is over that time. And the precision is phenomenal because the precision depends only on the width of that shadow. So it's really cool. You can get the, the mean rate of change since uh, 136 BC is 1.7 milliseconds per century, and that a Babylonian day was 37 milliseconds shorter than ours. So we have 37 milliseconds each day that the Babylonians didn't. <laughs> All right, that's enough of that. I better start talking about the ocean or I'll run out of time. So the problem of tidal friction is energy is extracted from the Earth's rotation. A very small part goes to the moon to push it out of its potential well away from the Earth. But most of it disappears into friction. How much energy disappears? Where does it go? And how is it dissipated? And those are the major questions for tidal friction. For a long time, it was thought that everybody knew the answer to this. Tidal friction is is mainly uh, caused by bottom friction in shallow seas. And it was thought to be solved problem by these two men, G.I. Taylor and Harold Jeffries. I was actually able to find a picture of Taylor in the exact year that he published this paper, 1919, but I couldn't find a picture of Harold Jeffries from 1920. This is a little bit early, so he's a little young there. Basically, G.I. Taylor uh, took measurements in the Irish Sea he computed the um, amount of uh, work done by the astronomical forces there on the Irish Sea and had current measurements at the entrances to the Irish Sea so he knew what the flux was in or out and so he could compute how much dissipation was in the Irish Sea. Harold Jeffries used the same method and looked at all the shallow seas all over the world. He summed them up and he got something that matched what the astronomers wanted. So the problem of tidal friction was solved, bottom friction in shallow seas. The trouble was that over the years, people started taking better measurements of the tide in places like the Bering Sea. Harold Jeffries thought a lot of the friction took place in the Bering Sea. People went there and got better measurements. It didn't look quite so large. So people took lots of measurements, and suddenly, the, or over time, the amount of friction in the shallow seas started going down. And the astronomers started revising their numbers and what they needed started going up. It started getting worse and worse until finally in 1968, Walter Monk delivered the Harold Jeffries Lecture to the Astronomical Society, Royal Astronomical Society. And he gave what maybe is the shortest and best introduction ever to a scientific paper. I'll read the whole thing. In 1920, it appeared that Jeffries had solved the problem of tidal dissipation. We have gone backwards ever since. <laughs> 1968, and I think we didn't really start going forward until Space Geodesy got into the act. And so Space Geodesy has a number of components. Lunar laser ranging, which I already talked about. It gives you the 
the motion of the moon, so you got a, a real hard constraint on, on what the totals should be. Satellite laser ranging, which I won't talk about at all, but that helps a lot. And then satellite altimetry, which allows you to map the tide where you, you couldn't before. So most of us talk about satellite altimetry here. NASA has now launched uh, all these satellites to do um, oceanography from space. There were a few earlier ones that were basically was geodesy. These are oceanography uh, satellites. It all had altimeters. And uh, there are some other altimeters that have been launched by the Europeans. Uh, right now, what's working still is Jason 2 is still working. And then Jason 3 just went up a few weeks ago. And looks like it's, it's quite good. For the tides, the real breakthrough satellite was Topex, though. It was the one where things really clarified. So uh, it's the dearest in my heart. And this is not just a NASA person praising Topex. I'll let Walter Monk do it for, for me as well. So, so Topex basically, with the altimeter, it allows you essentially to, to put a tide gauge at every spot in the ocean with an unusual sample rate, mind you. but you have measurements everywhere. So you can produce measurement, uh, you can produce pictures like this of uh, all the major tidal constituents. So this is M2, the main one. I'm sure most of you are quite familiar with it. You have, like in the northern basins here, you have these Kelvin waves going around basins like this with the highs on the right. And um, same in the North Atlantic. Um, the big thick line is when the uh, moon is over Greenwich. So I'll just call your attention to this one right here, and we'll come back to it in a minute. You can see that uh, the waves are going to the right there, so high tide along the coast of Australia is a, a few hours after the moon is over Greenwich. So you have pictures like this. How accurate are these maps? A lot of people have done uh, examinations of it, and I won't go into much detail, but they're far, far more accurate than anything that was available before altimetry. This is a paper that was just published uh, by Stammer and a cast of dozens, and all kinds of tests were done on the latest models. I think I'll skip most of that, although the bottom pressure instruments, and this is a, an example of one with Chris Hughes back there, if you know Chris, uh, are extremely useful for testing these things. Uh, I'll skip that. I'll show you this one example of using uh, bottom pressure data from the tsunami network. Um, so that gives you a time series, the bottom pressure. And then you can predict what the time series should be based upon these new models from altimetry, old models, some of them. And the difference then is plotted here as an RMS after you filter out everything with a period of longer than two days. So if you say everything faster than two days is tied, and then you compute the RMS between observed and predicted, you get these RMSs, one to two centimeters RMS. So if you hear somebody say, we can predict the tide out in the open ocean to one or two centimeters RMS, this is why you know that. OK, so back to the problem of tidal friction. How much energy is extracted from the Earth's rotation? Where does it go? How is it dissipated? How much energy we know very well now with these maps, global maps of the tide. You can work out what the rate is of the astronomical force on the tide. And it's in terms of this amplitude right here in a phase lag of that lagged ellipsoid that I showed you in the very first slide, that one spherical harmonic component, times some other constants. So here are a bunch of different tide models. And the work rate from those tide models are all in excellent agreement. 2.4 terawatts. This M2 only, if you want to look at all the other constituents, you have to multiply by about 1.5. So the total was uh, 3.7 terawatts. OK, so where does it go? We've made progress along those lines as well. And this is uh, now back to just M2 alone. And it shows how the, the planetary rate, 2.5 terawatts, gets split up you know, a part that goes and disappears into the ocean, a part that disappears into the solid earth, the solid body tide, and a, a small part that's in the lunar atmospheric tide, which you can detect if you have a long time series of barometer data. And then these split off into other parts. But in this talk, we'll just talk about this part, which um, 
decomposes this ocean part into a part that's deep and a part that's shallow. So that's what I'll talk about next, how to do that. And this is work that I did with Egbert a few years now. We, we looked at these very accurate tide maps and said, well, is there a way now to actually somehow map what the tidal dissipation is? And we decided the way to do that was to go at each point in the ocean, compute the rate of working done by all tidal forces on that spot, then compute the flux divergence, the energy flux divergence away from that spot. The difference should be what's dissipated at that spot. So that's what this equation is. That's just the total amount of working done at that spot of the ocean. And this is the flux divergence, energy flux divergence here. There's a little bit of a problem of, if you're not careful of circular logic here, because to, we know the elevations, but we don't know the currents globally. We have to invoke dynamics to get the currents. To invoke dynamics, you have to know something about dissipation, but dissipation is what we're after. So there's some subtlety there, which I won't go into, but the key to breaking that subtlety is that you have elevations that are so precise that it's the whole problem is pretty independent of what your initial assumption was on the dissipation. The way to get the currents globally is just to use Laplace's tidal equations. That's what this is. Um, so those are the two-dimensional momentum equations and the equation of continuity. And we solve this for every spot on the ocean. So at every spot on the ocean, we know everything on the right-hand side here. We're trying to solve for a U and V um, X and Y current, and we have three equations, momentum and continuity, so you do it in least squares, and you weight the continuity extremely heavily because that's where you benefit from these precise observations of Topex and Jason. Uh, this is just what the tidal currents look like globally. I'll just say one word. Remember I said um, in Australia there, it looked like from that elevation map that there was high tide along the coast of Australia a couple of hours after the moon was over Greenwich. Well, this is a plot of the currents when the moon is over Greenwich and a plot of the currents 90 degrees later. So you can see when the moon is over Greenwich, you have all these currents rushing toward the coast of Australia. So a high tide really will be there in a few hours. So it all kind of ties together with the elevation map as well. Okay, so back to the dissipation problem now.